Representative Robbins, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You're coming up on your fourth session here at the legislature. Uh, what has it been like up to this point? It's been fantastic. I mean, I'm so honored to serve my community. I'm learning so much. It's an incredible privilege to represent Rogers, Dayton, and Maple Grove in the legislature. And uh, I read in your campaign page a little bit of your bio. Um, it says that you were in high school, you participated in debate, youth in government, and other similar programs. Was running for the House of Representatives always in the cards for you? No. Um, so I thought about it more when I was younger. I had worked in Washington, D.C. for a member of Congress. And in those years, I kind of thought, well, maybe someday I'd like to run myself. But um, many years intervened, right? I have, so I was a stay-at-home mom for 10 years. I ran a nonprofit for many years. And I love to volunteer for other people, but I had sort of moved on from that dream. So it was not something I was planning on. And I've driven through your district. In fact, my wife works in your district, okay. 34A. Pretty unique. Um, one minute you're driving through a lot of businesses and uh, there's you know, cars, a lot of people. Another minute, and the next minute down the road, you could, you're in the country almost. Yep. There's, there's barns and there's farms. So uh, how would you describe your district? My district is the best of both worlds. I love the rural areas. There's a lot of horse farms. There's a lot of ag. It's so beautiful. But then we also have a thriving business community. We have a lot of med tech. We have a lot of logistics. We have a lot of manufacturing. So we really have sort of a, a great blend. And I feel like I understand issues that are affecting both greater Minnesota and um, metro and suburban Minnesota. And so what, what are some of those type of issues? Two different... I mean, you're kind of in two different worlds in your district. Right. Um, you know, I would say most things are common to everyone, regardless of where they live. So people really care about crime. They care about education. They care about being able to afford their lives, just, you know, groceries and school and all these different things. So I'd say that's common. Um, but then there are differences. Um, the, the more, um, I would say people are more concerned about crime in the suburban part of my district and less in the rural where, you know, it's just not as common. But that's changing. I mean, there's a lot of um, crime now in Rogers and Dayton even, and people are very concerned. Um, there's a little more um, interest in agriculture and um, uh, those kind of issues that have to do with farm and um, the CWD and those kind of things in the rural parts of my district. Broadband, surprisingly, is a really big issue in my district. There are parts of Rogers and Dayton that do not have um, reliable internet. And people think, oh, well, you're in Hennepin County, you're mm -hmm. fine. And it's not true. And so I'm working really hard on that. Just, just two weeks ago, we were able to finally get reliable high-speed broadband to a uh, mobile home park in Dayton, which has been essential for these families who've been working from home and kids trying to do homework from home. So I'm really grateful for that. But So we do have a lot of the mix of rural and urban issues in my district, which has been really challenging and, and really great to work on. And you serve on the House Human Services, Finance and Policy, Judiciary, Finance and Civil Law, and Tax Committees. What kind of policies or issues would you like to see addressed in 2022? You know, um, there are a lot of things we need to do. Obviously, we just the state just announced a $7.7 .7 billion surplus, and I think people are really excited about what that can be used for. I personally think the number one thing we have to do when we get back is address um, the, the looming tax increase on businesses through the unemployment uh, insurance. Right now, there's, we owe a debt to the federal government for um, using up the unemployment trust fund. And not only do we have to repay the debt, but now we're accruing interest every month. It's very substantial. So um, if we deal with that as a state and repay both the debt to the federal government and replenish the trust fund, it will stop the tax increase that's coming. We're looking at a 15 to 20% tax increase on small businesses starting in January. And that's really conservative, honestly. It could be higher than that. And whatever the balance is in that fund on March 31st of 2022, will drive tax increases again for next year. So this can't wait till the end of session because statutorily, whatever we don't deal with by March 31st is gonna trigger another round of tax increases. And our businesses are still struggling. People think, oh, they're open, they're fine. But I have businesses still closing in our district because first of all, they're still recovering from the loss in the pandemic when they were closed, but they're also struggling with the labor shortages, the supply chain issues. And so businesses cannot absorb a 15 to 20% tax increase. And a lot of them are still waiting for their tax refund 
from the P state taxing their PPP loans. That was supposed to be in the pipeline. I have businesses calling me because their quarterly taxes are due at December 31st and the state still owes them $10,000, $15,000. They're like, wait, they're wanting me to pay when they haven't refunded my uh, tax refund? So businesses are really struggling with cash flow and they cannot absorb this. So dealing with the UI is really the first thing we have to do. And then I really want to deal with the um, healthcare um, uh, frontline worker uh, bonuses. I'm so disappointed that didn't get done right away in September like we had promised everyone. Our healthcare frontline workers are just flat out giving everything they have and we should figure this out and get them some sort of support, if, if, ne if nothing else, is a sign of encouragement. Like, we're so grateful that they continue to give their all day after day. So I really want those two things. And then, you know, I'm, I'm working on education reform. There's a lot of other things we can do. But I think given the size of the surplus, this is a chance to do real tax reform. Generally, tax reform doesn't happen because people say it costs too much and they can't absorb it in the out years. Well, we have the opportunity now to do real tax reform because the state shouldn't keep collecting this huge surplus from families. Families need that money to spend for their own expenses. So let's figure out the tax reform, give it back to them, and that will lessen the surplus and hopefully be a constraint on the growth of government. And just finally, on a little bit of a lighter note, by the time this airs, we'll be past the holiday season, but inquiry minds want to know, <laughs> what are your top go-to foods for that big Christmas dinner or holiday dinner? Oh, so that's a great question. So my husband's from New England oh. and I'm Scandinavian mm -hmm. and our traditions are very different. So on Christmas Eve, we do my family tradition, which is more sort of the Scandinavian smorgasbord kind of meal after church. But on Christmas day, we do his tradition, which is, you know, um, uh, standing rib roast and uh, Yorkshire pudding and all of that. So two very different uh, food um, traditions in our house, but we've, we've learned to enjoy both.